So I know that there are a number of my former students here, and you're welcome. There won't be any cold calling, don't worry, <laughs> in, case, uh, in case you're worried about that. But you should feel absolutely free to uh, interrupt at any time if you want to, if you, especially if you have a clarifying question, I'm happy to take those. I know I sometimes speak too quickly. Um, I want to leave some time at the end um, in case you have questions about either the presentation or what's going on, or we don't have to talk just about Europe um, if you don't want to. Um, and um, I am um, the associate dean, so for those of you who don't know the governance structure here, which is, I hope, most of you, because who would <laughs> want to, right? So, so there's Rich, who's the dean, and then there's one associate dean. I'm also the deputy dean for various reasons. So I know a certain amount about what's going on in the school. So if you want to ask other stuff about what's happening in the school, feel free. Um, and um, the other thing I should say is um, my official title is I'm the Bernard T. Rocca Chair um, in <clears throat> International Business. And the only reason I say that is I'm the second one to hold this title and you should all be aware who is the first one, who is my mentor and the person who hired me, which was Janet Yellen, so one of our more famous pe um, people here. Okay, um, so let me start off. Um, so I wanna talk about EMU and, and Europe and Greece in particular, but not just Greece exclusively, um, and I wanna try and convince you that this will be the next financial crisis, okay, and um, I, I feel pretty strongly, okay, that this financial crisis, it could easily take place in the next two weeks, but will almost surely take place within the next couple of months. But that comes with a caveat, which is, I'm amazed that the crisis has gone on as long as it has. So the European crisis has been going on for five years, and every time I think there's just no way they can keep on going with it, something happens and they stumble along. So let me, um, let, let me proceed. So the, uh, <clears throat> what I want to deal with, the question I want to deal with directly is, what are the risks of a European sovereign debt crisis? So sovereign debt crisis is when a government can't pay its debts, okay? Um, now, I hope you all think that the very first thing that you would want to do to address that question would be to see what the markets think, okay? And that, that's the, the absolutely easiest thing to do. Um, uh, I updated my slides on Monday, and at that point, the Greek 10-year bond rate was just over 13%, okay? Now, 13% is actually not that high for Greece. Greece has seen 10-year bond rates of over 50%, okay? Um, but these days, it's, it's around 13%. Um, so the financial markets are sort of saying, you know, there's some risk, but it's not huge, okay? Uh, I'll compare this with, with other things. Um, and that's where, I, that's one thing I, I really want you to take away. The financial markets think at this point that there is some possibility of a European debt crisis, okay, a big financial crisis, but they're not really that concerned with it, okay? Um, for those of you who are interested, um, short-term interest rates, when there's a serious evidence of a financial crisis, often shoot into three digits and sometimes shoot into four digits, okay? So French interest rates in your lifetime have been over 2,000%, okay? That's what happens when there's serious evidence of a financial crisis. 13%, admittedly, for a 10-year bond rate isn't that bad, okay? So the financial markets think that the risks are non-trivial, but they're low, okay? Um, Economic and political fundamentals are terrible, however, just terrible, okay? So there is a Greek recession which has ended, okay? Probably ended um, uh, about six months ago, though they may have started another one, okay? But growth has been slow for over five years, and here's what I mean by growth, uh, growth being slow. Um, if you're in America, a growth rate of, say, 2% a year is not uncommon. If you're in Europe, you know, in Western Europe, 1% a year. If in, you're in Japan, zero. China, seven or eight, okay? Greece, over the last five years, has shrunk 25%, okay? So they're at running at negative 5% a year for five years in a row, okay? So the growth has been really slow. Unemployment is high. I'll show you some data later on, but unemployment being high in Greece means 25%. Now, 
If you haven't taken a class from me, okay, let me tell you a really important fact about unemployment. Unemployment rates are always biased down because lots of people who are really unemployed just say, I've given up looking. Okay, they're what are called discouraged workers. So when you see an unemployment rate that's measured at 25%, really it's much higher. And that's not actually the most important thing. The most important unemployment rate is not of that of the economy as a whole, it's of young people, especially young males, because they're the ones who cause trouble typically. So the 18 to 25 year olds, okay, so like when there are riots on the street or crime waves, they're the ones who are doing it. That unemployment rate for Greece is well in excess of 50% measured, okay? And that means in all likelihood, it's up to like 60 or 70%. So of the every four males that you see, young males that you see in a, in a place like Athens, three of them are really upset. So don't go to Greece this summer if on vacation <laughs> if, if I were you, okay. All right, okay. Um, now, um, because of all this unhappiness, okay, Greece is a democracy, it's a serious um, um, democracy, the birthplace of democracy, there was a new, new government elected uh, in January, the Syriza government, and it was elected by the people um, basically to stop austerity, to stop the period of slow growth, to stop government cutting spending and raising taxes and so forth. And the government, the new government is taking its mandate seriously, okay? And that's why they're trying to negotiate with the rest of the other side, and the other side consists of three parts, I'll talk about that, that soon, to end the austerity and get growth going again in Greece. And if you're a Greek person, you have every sympathy with the new government. They were legally elected, okay, on a platform of stopping austerity, getting growth going, lowering unemployment, Okay. The other side consists of three parties called the Troika, okay? um, and they're the European Central Bank, the equivalent of the Federal Reserve, those are the people who sit in Frankfurt. Okay. There's the IMF sitting in Washington, Christine Lagarde is, is, is the director of that, and the European Commission, that's sort of the European supranational government sitting in Brussels. And all of the other side, okay, all, all members of the Troika are vehemently opposed to changing any terms of the deal that, that Greece has, and we'll be talking about that. And they're at a huge political impasse. So for instance, yesterday in Riga, okay, in uh, Latvia, there was an enormous fight, and the two sides are just miles apart. And that's the reason why, with high likelihood, there will be a crisis associated with Greece in the next couple of weeks, or certainly in the next couple of months. Okay, so the IMF, the EC, and especially the Germans seem implacable so that there's gonna be no deal, and if there's no deal, Greece will probably default because it won't be able to pay its debts, okay? The other side is saying, fine, go ahead, default, okay, financial crisis. So what I wanna do is I wanna talk about the origins of this, make sure you understand stuff, and essentially be able to answer the question, who's right, the financial markets and the financial markets are not too worried about a European crisis, or the people who believe in fundamentals, who, who are watching the political and economic fundamentals, who are typically much more worried. Okay, so that's the, the, the basic motivation and what this is about. Okay, so <clears throat> the underlying causes of the crisis are political, economic, and financial. We'll, we'll go through all, all of that. The question is, are the policymakers and the markets each, each correct? okay, in their di different diagnoses, and I'm gonna argue no, okay? Um, and I, I do think this is a very serious problem for Europe, okay? Um, and it's a serious problem for Europe, but it's not gonna stay just in Europe, okay? If there's a financial crisis in Greece, if Greece defaults, you will be feeling it, okay? How many people here, you, you don't have to talk about yourself, you can talk about your friend, how many people, <laughs> is a standard thing I always used to do. Um, how many people have a friend with a money market account? Okay. Okay, all of you who raised your hand, you were exposed to the Greek crisis. Okay, all of you, okay. Um, and, and, and more than that. So I, I, I do believe the potential um, implications of this for the entire world are, are really serious and they'll be, they'll be felt pretty soon. Okay. Um, Usually at this point when I'm teaching, I say, it's a good time to pause for questions. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, anything unclear at this point, but in terms of motivation? Please. What, uh, exposure, uh, what you're clear, what you're exposed to a lot of favorable exposure in the money market. 
Your friends, your friends. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, here's the thing. Um, money market accounts are trying to get more than, for instance, what banks can get. Um, and they can't get very much in America because uh, American interest rates are really, really low. So what do they do? They go abroad for the, um, to the places that are offering higher yields. Okay, What's a place that's offering a higher yield? Well, just think, if Greek bonds are paying 13%, where do you think the extra return in your money market is coming from? It's from, ex it, it, <laughs> I'm not saying it's just, it, it, it's not, but usually money market accounts have diversified portfolios, okay? And so, you know, there's typically some exposure to the higher yielding Europeans in, in, in there. You know, so there's no guarantee. And, and of course, you might have a money market account that just holds American treasuries, in which case you're getting zero. But, um, but many people with money markets, just at the very least, are, are exposed to European stuff. Okay, all right, so let's get started. Um, <clears throat> okay, so <laughs> sovereign default, again, is, is an event where a government, like the government of Greece, but it doesn't have to be the government of Greece, it doesn't have to be a national government, it could be the government of California, cannot pay the, um, cannot service its debt, cannot pay the interest on, on, on the government debt. There have so far, um, there has so far been a default by Greece, okay, so that was engineered a few years ago, but it was voluntary, so it was not a credit incident, okay. Um, a voluntary um, default is where the owners, the creditors, agree to take a haircut to reduce the value of their debt, okay, and that's a, that was what, uh, what was called an orderly default because it was voluntary, okay, um, and now what, the, the big fear about default here is that, that there might be a disorderly default where the creditors do not agree to take a, a haircut, to take a, a write down on, on, on their debt. And that, that's the big fear. Okay, so the current government, uh, <coughs> Greek government um, debt um, rate, um, as I said, is about 13%. By way of comparison, the German 10-year rate, okay, the Bund rate, is on the order of 10 basis points, okay? So you hold German st um, stuff for a year, you get essentially nothing. You hold German, um, Greek stuff, if nothing else happens, you get 13%. So that's a measure of the riskiness. Um, the German rate is not the exception, it's the rule, okay? So rates, 10-year rates, so relatively long-term rates uh, for British, for Japanese, for American debt are also essentially low, okay? Um, so that's a, a, an important fact. So there is some risk that the financial markets are factoring in. No doubt about that. Okay. Um, every sane person, to the very best of my knowledge, says that the Greek government has way too much debt. It's on the order of 175 percentage points of GDP. There is no complete hard and fast rule on this. But most people think that if the debt to GDP ratio for a standard rich country like Greece exceeds on the order of 60 to maybe 80 percentage points of GDP, that, that's when you start asking questions. So Germany, for instance, is at 75% and shrinking. Okay. Um, everyone thinks that Greece has way too much debt. No one believes it's ever going to be paid off, or certainly not all of it. To the very best of my knowledge, that's a universally held view. Okay. Um, now, um, the Greek government used to be running large deficits that have been erased recently. So these three people, these three organizations on the other side that are negotiating with Greece, the Troika, and again, that's the IMF in Washington, okay, the European Commission in Brussels and the European Central Bank, they force the Greek government to raise taxes, cut spending, that's what austerity is, to eliminate the Greek deficit. So the, the Greek government is now running what's called a primary surplus. A primary surplus is, suppose that you ignore the spending on interest. Do your taxes more than cover your spending? And the answer is now yes for Greece. That's a very recent thing, okay? And the reason why the primary surplus is sort of an interesting concept is you're essentially saying, if we ignore history, if we ignore all the debt that's been accumulated by previous governments, is the Greek government at least covering its own spending right now? And the answer is yes. They're running a surplus. To pay off that debt, they would have to run a pretty big primary surplus for like the next generation. 
way bigger than any government in the history of the world has ever paid off. So nobody believes that Greece is going to be able to run a primary surplus and pay off all of its debt. Okay, so the, the, the debt's just way too high. Did you have a question or you're just stretching? Yeah. Yep. Yep, that's that is certainly true, and most people. Right. Um, so the big difference from Japan is most of the Japanese debt is held inside Japan, okay, um, which is not true for, for for Greece. It's it's held by by foreigners, especially by the IMF and 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 the European Central Bank. Um, but that's right. Most people do not expect that Japan will be able to pay off its debt. Right? So Japan's gross debt, by way of comparison, um, instead of being 175% would be on the order of 240%. Okay, so, it, so Japan has a very serious fiscal problem, absolutely. And if you follow Japanese politics, that's the big fight that they're having between the government and the central bank right now. So that, that's absolutely right. But the thing about the, the Japanese situation is they don't have to go to the rest of the world. They can deal with it themselves. Whereas Greece is tr totally dependent upon the Troika to be able to roll over its debt. Big difference. Okay. Okay. All right. So we have a fiscal mess right now. I want to now go into it in a little bit more detail and talk about where it came from so you can understand the origins of it. Okay. And then I want to talk about the manifestations of it. Okay. So how did this happen? Okay, the first thing you have to understand, and it's very important to understanding the European, especially the European Commission and the German view, is that this was never supposed to happen. This mess that um, Greece has an enormous debt that mo most people think is unpayable could not, um, cannot happen. Written into, uh, is anyone here from the Netherlands? Okay, good, so I'm gonna pronounce, mispronounce, uh, <laughs> I'm a big believer in the Netherlands, but the town where this treaty was signed, that's an international treaty, is the town, and I will mispronounce it, Maastricht, okay? So that's my, the closest I can do. So it's called the Maastricht Treaty. That's an international treaty that was signed between all the members of, it was then the European community, that settled on the details for EMU, that created it in, in the early 1990s. And one of the articles that everyone signed, including Greece, but also Germany, is, is I'll, I'll read it out because it's important, neither the community, it was the European community, nor any member state is liable for or can assume the commitments of any other member state. Okay, that is a constitutional treaty that says you cannot bail out Greece or anyone else. It is illegal for Germany or anyone else to transfer money to Greece to pay off its debt. Okay, now if you follow German politics at all, the constitutional court takes this really seriously. And one of the reasons why the chancellor of, the, of Germany, Angela Merkel, is vehemently opposed to another bailout is it would be illegal. Okay, really it would be illegal. Okay, they might ignore that, but it is illegal. Okay, still, Expediency counts in, in, in a big way, and the terms of the, uh, <clears throat> of, of the treaty might be technically okay, but the spirit of the treaty has been violated, of the Maastricht Treaty. Okay, and there are all these um, European bailout um, mechanisms that have been evolved, so I'll just list them very briefly to make sure that um, you're aware of how many there are. This crisis started in some sense in 2009. There was a, a big deal in, in May of 2010, and at that point they created what's known as the EFSM, the European Financial St um, Stabilization Mechanism. That was 60 billion, okay? Then they created another one at the same time, the European Financial Stability Facility, the EFSF, okay? May 2010, and that has the capacity to issue bonds Okay, for on the order of half a trillion euros, okay? Um, and so the total limit is 440 with um, 60 billion from the EFSM. Um, both of these things were not supposed to exist at all under the terms of the Maastricht Treaty because they're bailout mechanisms which are illegal, okay? Um, and the terms that they, 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 they wrote was that we will essentially bail out temporarily um, another member of Europe, if 
there is lending with conditionality. And who's in charge of the conditionality? This, this group called the Troika, the European Commission, the European Central Bank, and the IMF. So the basic deal is, if Greece or anyone else wants to take advantage of these bailout mechanisms, which aren't supposed to exist, okay, they can do so, but only with the agreement from these three institutions, the IMF, the European Commission, and um, the European Central Bank, the so-called Troika. Okay. And that's the thing that um, the Greeks really hate, because they have outsiders coming in to say, are you doing what you agreed to do when we agreed to bail you out? And what the, the, the terms of the bailout program are, are things like raising taxes on various things, cutting down on tax evasion, cutting pensions, cutting spending, firing civil servants, all that sort of stuff, austerity. Okay. But that didn't work uh, alone. <clears throat> Okay, so Greece got a bailout package um, from them. Ireland and Portugal followed, um, but that wasn't um, viewed as, as sufficiently big. So there's this other one called the European Stability Mechanism that was <clears throat> a permanent fund. That's another half a trillion dollars that was started a couple of years later because the European crisis dragged on, okay? Um, there's another one, the European Monetary Fund that also started a couple of years later. Then there's, whoops, um, the last one is Banking Union. Okay, so these are all mechanisms to try and deal with the Greek crisis. The banking union started less than a year ago, so there's a single supervisor for all European banks, at least uh, the, the large ones, which is the, the European Central Bank. So these are all essentially bailout institutions that have been created over the last five years. The details are unimportant. What's relevant is that these are institutions that really shouldn't exist, that weren't supposed to be there, that are, uh, have been created to deal with the Greek crisis as it lurches on from one inadequate response to another inadequate response. Okay, um, how do we get here, okay? Well, I wanna make sure that you understand how EMU started, okay? Because it's a relatively fa um, fast thing, and um, <clears throat> there are, five criteria that were applied for all countries that wanted to get into European Monetary Union, EMU. Technically, it's Economic and Monetary Union, okay? Um, and in order to get in, you had to satisfy five convergence criteria. So these were designed in the Maastricht Treaty and laid down in international law, and the idea was that only if you pass through these very demanding tests would you be allowed in, and the basic um, uh, reason, the, the basic rationale for this was we didn't want to have a crisis once a country was in, which is, of course, what, uh, the situation that we're in right now. So they tried to design EMU to make sure that it wasn't going to be a, a problem. Okay, so the five convergence criteria, I'll run through them in just a second. They were applied by what are called the Council of Ministers. So the Council of Ministers are the most important political um, directors, um, the, the, the heads of government in the European uh, Union. So it's like the Chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel, right? Francois Hollande, who is the President of France, the Prime Minister of England, the Prime Minister of Italy, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, because they were applied by politicians, they were written in economic terms, but they're highly political in practice. That's the application. Okay, so what are they? Okay, so the first convergence criteria turned out to be really easy to satisfy. If you wanted to get into the European Monetary Union, you had to have an independent central bank. Okay, that was an easy thing. That's a very standard thing now these days. It was new 30 years ago, but now it's a very standard thing. So the Bank of Greece, the Central Bank of Greece, is independent of the Greek government, etc. So that turned out not to be a big deal. Okay, second thing is in inflation. If you wanted to get in, your inflation rate had to be similar to the low inflation countries already in EMU, okay? So the way that it's a little bit convoluted, I'll run through it really briefly, take the three countries that are in EMU or going into EMU with the lowest inflation rates. Suppose that they're Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg. Take the average of those three. If you want to get in, your inflation rate has to be close meaning within one and a half percent of those inflation rates, of that average inflation rate. So the idea was that everyone would have very similar inflation going into EMU, which makes sense because you're gonna use one money afterwards, okay? So that was fine. That turned out to be very easy to, uh, um, for, for all the countries to hit in practice, not a big issue, okay. Third one, okay, was interest rates. 
And interest rates are interesting because remember we started off saying the Greek interest rate, the Greek 10-year rate is about 13%, okay? Whereas the German one is, is about 10 basis points. The third convergence criteria was your long-term interest rate, your 10-year interest rate had to be close, technically within 200 basis points, of the average long-term inflation rate for Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg, in my <coughs> example. So the idea was the markets had to say, you look like a safe financial bet. Your interest rate had to be low because, of course, long-term interest rates build in risk, like in, in the case of Greece right now, the risk of default, and expectations of low inflation. Okay, so th they were building in stuff like this in order to make sure that the financial markets thought that the currency union was viable before a country got in. And in practice, when EMU started, everyone's long-term interest rates were very low and very similar. This was not a difficult one to hit. Okay, do you have a question? Yeah, or a point? Than they are now, then, sure. Then there was what, what do we call a convergent trade off, in other words. Mm -hmm. Everybody went into this. Um, An arbitrage trade, basically, where they started buying up that debt in order to profit from the eventual EMU. And so uh, I guess my question is what, what were those there was a There was a big spread. There was probably a 5% spread, and then mm -hmm. they came way back down. No, in practice, when EMU started, almost everyone's long-term interest rates were very similar to each other, but much higher than now. Right, but I mean like two years before that. Now, the markets have been stable for years because everyone thought that everyone was on the glide path into EMU. It was going to be super simple. So way back when, Okay, so 96, 97, 98, things looked really stable. Remember the Clinton years? They were good years, and they were good in Europe, too, and so forth. No, it was not viewed as a serious problem back then. But I, I, th I just think I remembered a arbitrage trade of going into the EMU where rates, rates it, normalized. There were speculative um, opportunities, but they were on the order of like 50 or maybe 100 basis points, not as big as 200 basis points. So they allowed some, some differences. So right now, um, long-term California municipal bonds pay different interest rates from long-term New Jersey municipal bonds because they don't have exactly the same risk characteristics. They have lots in common, but some stuff that's different. So they don't have to be exactly the same, but, but they were pretty close. Okay, all right, uh, let's go on. Um, next one, so, and, and notice in, incidentally, these convergence criteria are just piling on. So we've only gone through three of them, but there were five because people thought, well, if you satisfy all of these, there's not gonna be a problem later on down the road. That, that, that's uh, the basic idea. So the fourth convergence criteria was exchange rates. So before EMU, Germany had the Deutschmark, France had the Franc, you know, Spain had the Peseta. Therefore, of course, there were exchange rates. Exchange rates had to be stable for the two years before EMU, okay? So that was also a big deal, okay? And in practice, that was not a crisis. There, you know, there was, it was easy for the countries getting into EMU to hit. So that adds extra um, um, confidence, okay? The last one, the fifth convergence criteria is, is the relevant one. Okay, so the fifth one has to do with fiscal stuff, okay? Which, of course, is where the issue is now. There were two parts to the fiscal, um, <clears throat> uh, the fiscal convergence criteria, okay. Um, and both of them technically had to be satisfied. So the first one was a flow one, okay. So the government runs a deficit if it's spending more than it's taking in, in in the form of revenue. If you ran a deficit, your deficit as a fraction of GDP had to be less than three percentage points, okay. That was viewed as the critical one. But there was also a stock equivalent, the accumulated stock of debt that governments had accumulated in the past. That had to be less than 60% of GDP, okay? Now, they allowed themselves some wiggle rooms, what, what, what economists like to call escape clauses, which is we will ignore one of these criteria if there, you give us a really plausible reason, okay? So in practice, okay, 
Um, Italy had a, a, a debt to GDP ratio of over 120%. And everyone said, well, we've got to have pasta in the EMU that we're just going to ignore that. <laughs> Belgium had a debt to GDP ratio of well over 120%. But you can't have a European anything without Belgium in it, because that's where Brussels is, right? So, um, <clears throat> and so Brussels still has a, Belgium still has a debt to GDP ratio in excess of 100%. Um, Greece had a debt to GDP ratio of well in excess of 60, over 100 percentage points of GDP. And they just ignore it, okay? So this is applied by politicians. Um, but the main focus was not on the stock one, it was on the first one, the flow, the deficit to GDP ratio. And lo and behold, when the time came for Greece to be considered seriously, they just hit 3.0000, okay? And then a couple of years later, it was officially announced that they had to restate their national accounts, okay? So there is no doubt in anyone's mind that they lied their way in. They never hit 3%. And that is one of the continuing sources of anger for the Germans, not just the Germans, that they never hit 3%. Yep? Wasn't it true, though, at the time that people like Hans didn't hit the 3%? No, no I, there, think, I, I think... There, there, were other, there, there were a lot of the other countries that were weak, didn't hit, hit those, not, not just the um, stock, but the flow... flow no. Um, France and Italy barely hit it down for a very short period of time, and they just hit it. But, but Greece is the only one who has never hit it. So there, there's pretty strong agreement on that. So that's one of the continuing sources of anger, that, uh, <clears throat> that um, Greece lied its way in. And, and most people think it was deliberate. Okay. Um, so fair enough, these things happen. But I want to con <clears throat> no, <laughs> what can you do, right? So uh, um, yeah, these things happen, right? Um, OK, so I want to continue to talk about the flow thing. So Germany in particular was really worried that a country like France or Greece or Italy, there are many people that, many different countries they were worried about, would hit 3% for just a nanosecond when they had to apply for their way in and immediately let the deficit go wild. So they um, tried to deal with this by what's called the stability pact, or it was sometimes called, if you're French, stability and growth pact, okay? So the stability pact says, once you're in EMU, you have to maintain a deficit of less than three percentage points of GDP or you face penalties, okay? So just to make sure you all understand this, why would, you know, like a country that, that's, that's uh, running a deficit of, say, 3%, why would the deficit all of a sudden get worse? Well, here's a very standard ex explanation. A financial crisis hits, like in 2007, 2008. Think about it as Lehman Brothers goes under, and for reasons particular to the subprime market in America, the entire world goes into recession which is not implausible, okay? Um, <clears throat> so, um, as a result of that, what's gonna happen to, let's say, the Greek government situation? Well, during bad times, there's less income, okay? So tax revenues fall. During bad times, there are more unemployed people, there are more, peop more poor people, so transfers to unemployed and uh, poor people rise, government spending rises, government tax receipts fall, your deficit rises. And if you have signed a, a treaty that says you have to maintain a deficit of 3% or face penalties, what you're going to do is, during bad times, raise taxes or cut spending, both of which worsen your own domestic economy. So that's what's called pro-cyclic fiscal policy. During bad times, you make things worse. And that's, one of the, that's the fundamental reason why the Greek government, and if you read Paul Krugman, most American liberals are opposed to stuff like this. They think it would just make bad times worse and make good times too good. Okay, so that's the, the stability pact that's trying to maintain the 3% cap. Um, uh, ironically enough, shortly after EMU started, a large number of countries, including France and Germany, but also Italy, hit the 3% um, target and violated it. And people said, well, they're large countries, Screw it. You know. <clears throat> so they've been breached all over the place repeatedly. So they're trying to bring back in these, um, these, th this 3% cap, okay? 
Um, that was a, a big thing a, a, a few years ago. It's unclear whether they will actually succeed in that. But that's a, that's a, a, a different matter that I don't want, really want to talk about. Okay, but still, Greece is over um, is over three uh, percent when the crisis starts in 2010. So there is more pressure for fiscal austerity. Okay, and that is the issue that is going on to, through the present day. So yesterday in Riga, there was considerable pressure by all members of the Troika, the fund, the European Central Bank, and especially the European Commission, all the rest of Europe, for Greece to continue reform. So what is reform? raise those taxes, cut down on tax evasion, cut government spending, you know, cut the, the, the um, especially pension reform is, is considered to be a big thing. Greece has way too many labors, um, um, uh, <coughs> labor markets that are rigid. Um, you've got to reduce those, reduce the size of the social security net, um, and so forth. Um, and that's why there is pressure on Greece that continues through the present day for fiscal austerity. And it's not just Greece. Okay, let me just say in passing, Portugal, Spain, Ireland, Italy, and so forth, they're also experiencing the same thing. Okay, so that's essentially where we are to, today. Okay, so the question is, will this work? The markets right now aren't panicked. And again, the primary uh, <coughs> exhibit in favor of that is the fact that the bond rate is only 13%. Okay, uh, many people like me, many commentators, okay, um, agree with the markets. Some people disagree. Okay, what I want to deal with now is should you be thinking about this problem this way at all? Okay, so I'm, hopefully I've, I've, I've brought you up to date with the, 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 the European situation, but this is not the way we deal with this problem in a class that I teach. It's not what we do at Haas. Okay, so I want to take a different tack now. Okay, um, how should you think about EMU at all? Is this the right way to think about the problems that are affecting Greece? And the answer is going to be no. Okay. So how should you think about EMU? <clears throat> okay. Economists, and, and, and I will say, and you should be able to verify this if you've taken a class from me, uh, our MBA students ask different questions about EMU. Okay. And the most important one, and certainly one that we try to drill into everyone, is the big question is, do European um, countries look like what's called an optimum currency area? An area which should have one currency. Should Greece be using the same currency as Germany, as France, as the Netherlands, as Spain? Okay. Now, there's an empirical analog to that, which is almost exactly the same question, um, which is, do European countries look like regions of America? The, um, the United States is one currency union. California uses the same money as Florida and as um, Texas and as New Hampshire. Is that a good idea? That's the same question. Okay, so let's go into this. Um, this won't take very long. The idea of an optimum currency area is uh, associated with the name of a very famous Canadian, um, Robert Mundell, who won the Nobel Prize um, about 15 years ago at this point. And here was his, his idea. Um, he asked the question, when are two regions, and they don't have to be from the same country, they can be two different countries, when are two regions likely to gain from using one money? Okay, and here's the answer. There are two parts to it. If they share deep trade links, that's one part. That's a necessary but not sufficient condition, okay? Um, if two areas share a lot of trade, they do a lot of trade between them, then they gain from using one currency. Now that's a very intuitive idea. Okay, I live in Berkeley, okay, and I live far away from Oakland, at least 35 feet, okay? Uh, <clears throat> the next house is actually Oakland on, on, on my street. And incidentally, um, if you're thinking about um, buying a place on Vicente Road and you're a former student of mine, don't worry, I already have three former students of mine who already live on my street, so don't feel obligated to, to, to do so. Um, okay, it's a pretty short street. Okay, um, so suppose that Berkeley and Oakland had different monies, okay? And Berkeley used the berserkly and Oakland used the American dollar, okay? And every time you wanted to engage in a transaction in Oakland, every time I wanted to go to the Safeway at, at college and and, and Claremont, I had to use Oakland dollars 
But if I wanted to buy something at the Berkeley Bowl, I had to use Berserkliums. I'd have to keep two different monies in my wallet. I'd have to keep track of different prices and figure out whether I should buy my avocados in Oakland or in Berkeley. What a pain, that would disrupt trade, okay? So if you engage in a lot of trade, if people in one area buy a lot in the other and so forth, it's just way easier. It cuts your transactions cost to have just one money. Okay, so that's a big gain. So that's one necessary part of two regions having the same money. Okay, and again, notice that these don't have to be countries. They don't have to be regions. They can be cities. Okay, yep. They could, but like so, for instance, um, every time that I want, wanted to go skiing or I wanted to go to Reno, okay, I, if I had to use the Nevada dollar instead of the California dollar, I would probably go to Nevada less frequently. It would cut down on trade between those two regions. It would be a pain, okay? There, there might be some gains, and I'll talk about those in just a second. You could imagine doing it that way, but this is one critical thing. Okay, here's the other one. Um, if they share the same business cycles, that's the other part. So for two regions to, to gain from using the same money, they have to engage in lots of trade and they have to have the same business cycles. So the idea is when one um, region is doing well, okay, and probably needs tighter interest rates to sort of squelch down the economy and prevent it from overheating, if the other one needs a boost, they need very different monetary policies they probably can't get along together in one current, uh, in using one money. But if when California is doing well, Nevada is also doing well, and so they both need tighter money, higher interest rates to sort of damp down inflationary pressures, then things are gonna work well. So Mundell's idea is there are two important things that you have to have for two regions of any size to gain from using the same money. Lots of trade and similar business cycles. If they have very different business cycles and one needs a low interest rate when the other one needs a high interest rate, you've got some serious problems. Okay, so let me go on. Oh, did you have a? Yeah, well, I just had a question. Yep. I was expecting you to just say labor mobility. I'll talk about that in just a second. <clears throat> okay, all right, so let's go on. Um, so um, <clears throat> suppose that two regions have different business cycles. Okay, so we can talk about, for instance, right now, Finland is not doing too well because of the sanctions that are on Russia. So sanctions have been placed on Russia because of the Ukraine. Finland hits it, or Finland um, gets into problems because Apple is doing really well and Nokia is doing really poorly and so forth. So Finland has a, its own problems. Um, so suppose that Finland is doing poorly when Germany is doing well, which is actually true. Okay, there has to be some sort of adjustment because they have asymmetric business cycles. One, one is doing well, Germany, while one is doing poorly, Finland. Okay, um, if, you, if there's no way for those two regions to adjust, then you've got inflationary pressures in Germany, which they loathe, and you've got a recession in Finland, which they are very unhappy with. They're unhappy, but in different ways. The inflation makes the Germans unhappy, the recession and unemployment makes the Finns unhappy, so they're unhappy in different ways, so Tolstoy is happy with, with all of this stuff. Um, <clears throat> and um, so uh, there, we have to be able to deal with this. These costs, the, the things associated with asymmetric business cycles are really a big deal. Okay, so how can two regions cope with asymmetric business cycles? Here's one, okay. So one way is sharing risks. So suppose that there's a Robin Hood set of taxes, a supranational fiscal authority, a system of taxes and transfers, there are many different ways to describe this, that takes from, that taxes the rich, the Germans, and transfers it to the people who need it, like the Finns, okay? That's a way of alleviating the inflationary pressures in Germany, because the taxes are reducing the inflationary pressures in Germany, but the taxes are then flowing to the Finns who need them for unemployment insurance, okay? And that's one way of dealing with, 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 with the risk, okay? Um, suppose you don't have this, okay? So there's a different way to proceed, factor mobility. So this was the point that was said. Suppose that the unemployed Finns move to Germany. That alleviates the unemployment in Finland 
and it also reduces the, uh, the inflationary pressures in Germany because the people coming into the labor market in Germany will lower wages and so forth. So that relieves both unemployment and, and inflation. Okay, so that's fine. So what's the idea of Mundell's optimum currency area? He says the following. Suppose that two regions have fundamentally different business cycles, asymmetric business cycles, and there is little risk sharing okay, and immobile labor. So there's no system of taxes and transfers, and there's immobile labor. Then the syllogism goes, three, you gain from having different monies. So Finland could have a very loose monetary policy. Germany could have a very tight monetary policy that could alleviate the unemployment in Finland and the inflation in Germany. Everyone gains, okay? So you want different monies, okay, when you have asymmetric business cycles and neither risk sharing nor mobile labor. Okay, so that might be a little abstract. Let me apply it very easily, okay? So take a look at America, okay? When California is doing well, as it is right now, is Florida doing well? Is New York doing well? Is Ohio doing well? Pretty much, not perfectly. So right now, North Dakota is really suffering because the price of oil has plunged a lot. So not all areas in the United States are doing equally well, but basically when things go up in one area, they go up in another, but not perfectly, okay? So North Dakota, how do we deal with the fact that they're doing poorly when the rest of the country is doing well? Well, is there a system of risk sharing in the United States? Absolutely, the federal government takes a lot of your, your income in taxes and redistributes it to, the, to um, individuals spread out around the United States, but not equally. If there are lots of unemployed people in North Dakota, that's where a lot of the funds go. Okay, so there is a system of risk sharing in the United States. Okay, is labor immobile in the United States? No, nope. a lot of the people who are unemployed in North Dakota only went there, okay, because of the boom, because the, the, the fracking boom, and they will uh, eventually, and some of them re uh, relatively fast, leave and go to other places that are booming. Okay, so the United States has pretty symmetric business cycles, a big system of risk sharing, pretty mobile labor. It makes sense for it to have one currency. Okay, think about Europe on the other hand. Okay, Greece has been in recession on and off for five years. Same thing is true of Portugal. Same thing is true to a first approximation of Spain, of Italy, of Ireland. So there are some areas that are doing very poorly. There are some areas that are doing really well. Call that Germany, okay? <laughs> big asymmetries, big asymmetries, okay? Is there a system of risk sharing? Well, the European Commission has a budget for all of the 28 countries that are in the European Union. It's small, on the order of 1.3 percentage points of GDP. That's on the, on the order of um, uh, 15 times less than the American federal government. So it's small, and almost none of that is discretionary because they waste most of it through common agricultural policy, okay? So there is no system of risk sharing. Is labor mobile? Okay, well remember, unemployment rates exceed 25% in Spain and Greece now. In principle, they could move to Germany, but they don't. Now we don't know whether it's linguistic or legal stuff or housing or family or purely cultural, but we know in practice, unemployed people in the south of Europe simply don't move to Germany, okay? So Europe has asymmetric business cycles, no system of risk sharing, okay, and <clears throat> immobile labor. So Europe does not look like an optimum currency area, the end. That is the easiest and most in effective and certainly the most economically grounded way to think about what's happening in Europe right now. EMU, in some sense, was doomed from the start. It was not well designed. It is not an optimal currency area. Okay, so let's go on. <clears throat> um, fiscal austerity is not the solution. Okay, the way to get Greece to pay more is to engage in fiscal austerity. They hate it. Okay, why is this a problem for EMU? Because EMU wasn't designed to be an optimum currency area. 
there is no way to cope with the fact that Greece has a serious asymmetric problem that they were, they were doing poorly when Germany is doing well. The Greek problem is associated with the fact that it's not part of an optimum currency area. They have poor competitiveness. Okay? And the manifestations, I'll show you some data in just a second, are they're unable to run a current account that's balanced, so they, they export much less than they import, they have slow growth, they have unemployment, and that's true of other countries too, not just Greece. Everything I say is also true of Portugal, Ireland, Spain, and Italy. This is a classic example of an asymmetric shock. Some bad stuff happened to Greece, and there was no way for them to respond inside EMU. Okay, so let me give you some data, okay? Um, <clears throat> so this is um, data on competitiveness within the um, uh, EMU. So the real effect of exchange rate, that's the single easiest way to compare competitiveness across countries, okay? So this is calibrated so that 2010 um, was equal to 100. Germany has fallen to 94.5% for the, the last year for which we have full data. Okay, so they've gained about 5% competitiveness over the last five years or so. Um, uh, Greece has lost 3%, so everything in Greece is on the order of 8% more expensive than it was in Germany, at, at least as of the most recent data that, that we have. Okay, and the same thing is true if you look at the other Club Med countries. As a result, Germany, of course, is exporting like crazy. They have this mad and massive current account surplus on the order of eight percentage points of GDP. So they're exporting way more than they're importing because they're very competitive. Whereas the other countries are running big deficits, shrinking because they're running, especially for Greece, because they run out of income. Okay? Um, and unemployment in Germany is really low. Germany is doing really well. They've had a positive shock, while Greece has unemployment rates in excess of 25%, so does Spain. So classic example of an asymmetric shock, good for Germany, bad for the southern countries. That was the financial crisis, okay? And no way for them to respond because they're not part of an optimum currency area. So you present this as, uh, you present this as if uh, as German is uh, performing better and these other countries are performing yep. poorer. But isn't this, um, is it the case that this is more the characteristics of this system, that this system um, benefits an exporter like Germany um, and it punishes uh, an importer uh, as these others? And right. therefore, Germany is actually performing better, not because it's a better economy, but because the system is rigged in their favor. Well, I wouldn't say it's really rigged. It's just Germany received some positive shocks. Germany, in particular, gained competitiveness. They engaged in labor market reforms a decade ago. Okay, a decade before that, and they are, they've been re, uh, reaping the benefits. If Germany had an uh, independent uh, currency, uh, wouldn't they uh, actually be exporting less because their, uh, their currency would float, uh, yeah. and as a result, their products would be more expensive, it would be more difficult for them to export. But because they are basically in the same union with a bunch of dogs, um, that that's pulling down the value of the euro, and it's benefiting uh, Germany, Germany uh, and it's coming across as you've you've outlined here. And so everything, so everything you say is consistent with what what I've done. So Germany right now is doing really well within EMU. If they had their own currency, okay, and instantly there's a major political push inside Germany to stay inside Europe but to leave EMU, okay. If the Deutsche Mark came back, it would appreciate, which would reduce their competitiveness, okay, and increase the competitiveness of Greece and Italy and so on and so forth, and would reduce their, their current account deficit. That's all true, okay? Um, so they gain so long as EMU st um, stays in right, right now. So it's built into the system in the sense that an asymmetric shock that's good for one area and bad for another just can't be coped with. Okay. Let, let, let me just go through, I, I have one more slide, I want to give my bottom line and then it, it'll hopefully tie things together a little bit and then we'll, we'll, I'll take questions. Okay, so what's my bottom line? It is true that Greece has a fiscal problem. They have way too much debt, okay? They're not going to be able to, to pay it all off. <clears throat> but even if they could 
okay, which I think is politically impossible at this point. Even if they could, that wouldn't restore growth. Okay. Um, it, and, and it's very difficult for them right now, after five years of really slow growth, and they're probably in recession again now, it is very difficult for them to maintain high taxes and to keep on cutting government services, especially after a new government was elected to reverse this. Okay, so I think that that's essentially uh, politically impossible to solve their fiscal problem, but even if they could, it wouldn't reduce the competitiveness problem. The real problem is that they have poor competitiveness compared with Germany, as does Italy, as does Spain, as, as, um, as does Portugal. Okay, so their bubble overhangs, there was overbuilding in Greece and in the rest of the, the southern periphery that didn't occur in Germany, okay? Um, and as a result, okay, because they're not part of an optimum currency area, they have no way to respond to this asymmetric shock within EMU. And there is just no easy solution for that. EMU was poorly designed, okay? Sooner or later, this was going to a, a appear. So my view is that a more serious crisis, the breakup of the EMU sooner or later, is inevitable. Okay, now when that takes place, okay, some people think it's not going to be a big deal. Now, that was also true before Lehman Brothers went under. Okay, so Lehman Brothers, don't forget, uh, was the smallest of the investment banks, people knew it was on the rocks, and people um, thought, well look, we have to let one of the investment banks go under to make sure that everyone knows that the rules of the game are tough, okay? That we are not gonna bail out everyone. That was the view before Lehman Brothers, and the markets anticipated it's not gonna be a big deal. Greece, okay, is a country, not a small investment bank, and there have been international efforts for five years now to keep it afloat. So I think this could easily be way worse than Lehman Brothers. Okay, so that is why I think a financial crisis here is inevitable. I don't know what form it will take, okay? But sooner or later, this is gonna come up and it will probably be sooner, okay? So that's the end, let me, let me take uh, questions because we have, we have lots of time, so please, you were first. I think that you're supposed to go use the mic for the benefit of future generations, <laughs> so. Uh, just probably a straightforward question. Why can't they just leave and do the whole process in reverse for Greece? Isn't okay, that so, um, <clears throat> so that's, uh, many people think that uh, it's called Grexit is, is inevitable. It's going to be almost impossible to do that in a clean fashion, okay? So let me make sure you, you all understand. If you're a member of the European Union, as Greece is, okay, it is illegal to place any barriers on the international flow of goods, services, labor, or capital between Greece and any of the other 27 members of the European Union, okay? So that, that's illegal, okay? Putting on capital controls is illegal. They could probably do it for a short period of time. Cyprus did, but it is, it, it's a big deal. Suppose that you're in Greece right now, okay? And you bank with your local neighborhood bank, okay, Greek bank you can um, ask for all of your funds to be withdrawn, maybe leaving a small balance for, for, for working capital, walk across the street to Deutsche Bank's local branch and ask for all of that to be wired to Deutsche Bank in Frankfurt or wherever you want. That is perfectly legal, okay? Suppose there was a rumor of, of Greek leaving the euro. Okay, you would have a massive capital outflow. It's been continuing um, for the last couple of months at pretty high levels, but it would be massive, okay? How can you stop that, that enormous financial drain? This would be a run on a country, not on a run on a bank, a run on a country. How could you stop that? Put on capital controls. As Soon as you do that, they have violated the Single European Act. They are no longer a member of the European Union. Okay, and incidentally also, suppose that Greece does leave and the Greek drachma fa um, falls, which I think everyone expects, okay? Anyone who holds that Greek debt, it is in default, you're gone. Who holds almost all of that debt? The IMF and the European Central Bank. The European Central Bank might be insolvent right after Grexit. Now, they could deal with it, they just get more capital. Nothing gets a central bank angrier than having to recapitalize itself, not other banks, okay? 
And just to make sure you're aware of it, um, the European um, uh, Monetary Union is in danger of deflation right now. They have a serious problem, even ignoring Greece, okay? Um, not, not a good time for such things to, to take place. So it, it would be a mess, a real mess. So please, yeah. Uh, it's a bit dif mm, different question, I guess, but um, uh, three governments are printing money, I mean, not government, but the three areas are printing so much money, unprecedented. And at the, on the other hand, like countries like China, who started AIIB, and uh, some say that the, uh, this is the end of the, uh, the beginning of the end of Bretton Woods uh, structure. And what do you think? And uh, if it, you agree to that opinion, then uh, what would be like in 10, 20 years as to the macroeconomic situation, what do you think? Or okay. fiscal situation. So it is true that uh, <clears throat> the Japanese, the Europeans, and the Americans are all engaging in, in pretty serious monetary expansion. The American one is fading, okay? Um, do I think that uh, uh, <clears throat> that's the end of, it's called Bretton Woods II. The original Bretton Woods ended in the late 60s. Um, probably, but we, we don't really know because we don't know whether it's a short-term um, uh, uh, property bubble collapsing in China or something more serious. But, Here's the one thing I never ever do is make a forecast out more than a day or two, right? So like the idea of doing some, saying something about what's gonna happen in 10 or 20 years, that's just not gonna happen. This is a much more immediate thing. And in 10 years, the Greek problem will be a, some, something of the, of the distant past, not that important probably. Please. I'm gonna play the devil's advocate and say, as Greece, look, this is a, easy to solve you transfer a lot of money from Germany to pay off our debts. And by the way, yeah, in the Maastricht Treaty it says you, you can't do that, but you waive the rules on deficits, you've done all sorts of other things over the years, so just sort it out for us, and that's the way to deal with it. Yeah, okay, yeah, and, and uh, that is not outrageous. That is the current Greek government's position. It's not going too well, right? So, so and, and they're, they're essentially saying, we're willing to, to, to do a deal with you. You've got to stop the austerity. You've got to stop the, in, the intrusive inspections by the Troika into the, the Greek government. Um, that is what they're trying for. So far, it's been a complete failure. Now, might it be good for Europe? Yeah, sure, it might be good for Europe. It, the idea of a Greek crisis um, it would not be caused just by Greece. It would also be caused by Germany. There's no doubt about that. If it's a poker game, it, it, and the market is, is essentially saying that they believe the Greeks will win the poker game then. Yeah, it's not really a poker game, because a poker game, there's a winner, there's a loser, but there's a winner. Okay, that is, no, that is certainly not guaranteed. Everyone could lose from this. If there's a disorderly default, okay, Greece will lose massively, no doubt about that. But so will everyone else in Europe and probably everyone else in the world, okay? Because the price of risk on world markets will just go shooting up, stock markets will tank all over the world, just like after Lehman, okay? So there is not gu guaranteed to be a winner uh, out of this. So it, it, it's a fight, but if there's no deal, everyone could lose. So, but otherwise, your point is well taken. Oh, I'm sorry, there's one, uh, okay. You, you get one, uh, but, oh, uh, you have yeah. a mic. Okay, yeah. please, I'm sorry. Sorry, good afternoon. So act actually you mentioned like three, um, well, or, or a couple of, uh, of uh, mechanism to make a currency area, uh, or a optimal currency area, okay. One was uh, our sharing the risk mm -hmm. of, okay. And then you actually, at the beginning of your presentation, mentioned all the, uh, systems that the European Union created for the bailout yeah. rescues and yeah. so this may be happening and these actually these these systems are in place already then you mentioned the immobile um, labor uh, mobility yes yeah, so people going to other countries and actually this is happening it's maybe just taking some time to adjust but people from Spain or Greece are going out from to Germany and so it seems that the European Union has this mechanism you mentioned to be like an optimal area it, it, it's maybe taking 
it's not happening from one year to the other, but it, it makes it may take five years. So what do you? With respect, I disagree on both. <clears throat> okay, so labor mobility is the easiest one. If labor were mobile inside Europe, you wouldn't see unemployment rates in excess of 20% in the south and unemployment rates in you know, below 6% in the north, not simultaneously. So yes, labor adjusts over generations, okay? But that's not fast enough to deal with a business cycle problem. Um, is there a serious risk sharing mechanism? Um, I don't see how one can plausibly say that because when North Dakota um, starts to suffer because of um, the collapse of the price of oil and, and fracking going under, the flows to North Dakota to the unemployed people there are automatic and they are not politically controversial in the slightest. No way can one say that about Europe right now. So the flows that are going into Greece are incredibly politically controversial. There's a huge fight over every single one. Okay, so there's no obvious and easy system of risk sharing. There's just one comment on that. So actually, for the last years, uh, in the European Union, we, we perceive that there, was, there has been a great, um, so life, la, uh, life was better from the last year because of these structural monetary policies when the union was created. So for many countries, they, they, their, their, um, so their life was, the life was increasing, was better in terms of, um, how do you say that? I'm sorry. Um, so the standard of living was mm -hmm. raising for these countries. So actually there has been a long process of the people from the European Union getting a better life there. And this was yep. in part because of this monetary union. So I'm not sure if, Maybe, I, it is certainly true that the euro is very popular in Greece, unlike Germany, <laughs> I, I, I will say. So uh, they'd be happy to get rid of the euro in, in, in Germany. Uh, but still, the idea that Angela Merkel will sign off on large flows from Germany to Greece, that's just never going to happen, not in this world. So. And w maybe we can take one more because we've hit 3 o'clock and I don't want to keep you late, so please. Speak loudly, then. Uh, so, so given the business cycles and the labor markets, everything that they have in Europe, so how many currencies do they need? Do they just need 28 currencies and that's it? Or, or five enough or three? Or what, what would you say? Okay, I don't really know, but probably uh, the view is at least three or four. So they had way too many to begin with. Um, and that's one of the, the things about the European monetary system, which locked exchange rates together and made it easier. But um, I could easily see Germany sticking together with Belgium, the Netherlands, <coughs> Luxembourg, Austria, and a, a, a core like that, and two or three in the south. But 28 is ridiculous, right? There's no doubt about that. But one is also ridiculous. So. Thank you. I'll be around afterwards. Yeah. And, uh, thank you.